I'm sorry, Philippians chapter one, the book of Philippians chapter number one. Uh, we're not we're not moving as fast as I hoped we would on this, and I sure don't like to drag stuff out like this, but uh, don't want to skip over so much important things either. So uh, a little balance there you have to have when you're teaching. Um, I, I've known I've seen preachers before, and they said, uh, "Brother Danny, we've been in." Revelation for five years, only, you know, and after a while, people start just going, oh, you know, after a while. But you could do it. You could stay in one book forever. But so we try to keep it moving, give you the high spot study on your own, and that would be good also. Philippians chapter number one, we've covered some very, very, very good stuff here already. We really liked verse 12, where Paul was saying the, all the things that's happened to me. I got put in jail. I got. I got beat, I got up, but it's happened to the furtherance of the gospel. And that's a great encouragement to me and any preacher, knowing that whatever trouble we might go through, whatever the devil might throw on us in the work of God, the Lord will use it to even get the gospel out even more. Even our sickness, even our shortcomings, our trials and burdens and, and things like that. And then we talked about people that preach the gospel in verse 15, 16, that wasn't really right, but they're preaching the truth anyway. And Paul said, either way, if the gospel gets out, I'll rejoice over it. He wasn't putting his approval on crazy preachers, but what he was saying was, if the word of God gets out there and gets in somebody's heart, then praise God. That's basically what he was saying. Now tonight, uh, we'll pick up there in verse number 20 and try to uh, line this up down through there here in the, in the next few minutes. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, verse 16 Happens a lot of time. Uh, preachers and churches do stuff that, that what we call spite churches, spite meetings. Years ago, when I, was, I was preaching youth meetings at certain churches. Certain these two churches were mad at each other, and and I was going to preach a youth meeting there. And some of the other church company said, "Guess what, brother Danny? We're having a youth meeting that same weekend." I said, "Oh man, I hate that." He said, oh, "It's on purpose. It's an anti Danny youth rally." And he said, the only reason the pastor scheduled it is because you was coming and he didn't want us going over there. Now, that's, that's crazy. That's, that's, that's an insecure, backslid uh, preacher uh, who's, who's that's, that's the wrong motive. But somebody might have got saved at that youth rally. If they did, hallelujah, right? And so uh, that, that's what that verse is talking about. Now, we're looking at verse 20 tonight. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing, I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Great statement, great statement. Full of, full of, full of stuff there. Uh, full of things there. He said, the first thing you'll notice, he said, I'm, I'm not ashamed to, <laughs> excuse me, stand up and boldly declare um, uh, the things of God. Now, boy, do we ever need that. Do we ever need that. We don't need a bunch of self-righteous, spiritual, smart alecks, but we do need some Christians that will boldly take a stand for what's right. Amen? And everything that we do, that Christ could be glorified in our, in our body. Now, when he says that, he's talking, about, he's talking about just, you know, your everyday life. Everyday life. Paul said, I'm, I'm not ashamed. I'm, I'm shocked at sometimes how... Um, Christian people are literally, literally ashamed to let the cool people at work know that you're a Christian. People, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, and you believe in Jesus Christ and heaven and hell and the Bible and all that, you don't have anything to be ashamed of in any company. You say, well, I'll go to our Christmas party and they're all, they're all talking about going to uh, get drinking and they're all talking about partying and they're all just they're so they're pretty and they're good looking and they drive nice cars and I just I just feel so uh, you know, you're supposed to feel out of place but you are not supposed to be ashamed amen that's right don't you ever be ashamed uh we we're playing playing ball the other night I'm I'm playing in the old man's team over there and Lenore they have an over 50 uh league and, and Lenore and they couldn't get enough 50s to play so they're having it down in the 40s so I was playing, and every time I go, that guy looks at, he looks at me. I don't even know how he knows me. He looks at me, and he said, you want to lead us in prayer? I said, I sure do. And they all stand around. I get down. I done it Monday night. 
And I said, Lord, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. Thank you for these men. I pray you bless them and their families. And I thank you for this opportunity we have to get out here and exercise a little bit in fellowship. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help every one of us to live our life every day the way we wished we had when we stand before you face to face in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't care if they're Muslim. I don't care if they're uh, atheist. I'm not going to be ashamed of the Lord. I ain't going to go somewhere that I can't be, as I'm going to be ashamed of Him. Yeah. Amen. People, I've had people tell, say, well, you can come here, but leave your religion outside. Sorry, we ain't coming. If you tell me I can't bring Jesus, if you say, you can't mention Jesus this Christmas, see you later, bud. Amen. Isn't it funny? You know, I saw on the news one night this week, it just said, uh, I catch, I catch about five minutes of it today, see if the world blowed up. I tell Kelly, I said, I'm going to turn the TV on and see if the world blowed up. But I guess we'll hear it in a little while if it does. But, uh, I just, you know, if it's the same old thing over and over and over and over and over, that's all the news is. Something big happens once in a while, and they'll milk that for about three months. And so I, I want to see what the, what the big news was. And it was saying uh, a lot of the big department stores up north are saying now they don't want any Christmas decorations at all. And not even, not, not, not just Mary and Joseph and the baby and, and a Christmas tree and all that. They don't want the colors green and red. They said people may be offended People might be. I wonder if they had orange at Halloween. Bunch of hypocrites. That offends us. All the witch, witchcraft offends us. They don't care what we think. But they got a certain bunch of perverts running in places that, that hate Christmas and, and what it stands for. Listen, the colors red and green have absolutely nothing to do with any religion in the whole wide world that I know of. The colors red and green mean nothing to a Christian, one way or the other. That don't mean nothing. That don't mean you're a Christian. It don't mean you ain't. The, the, the color, uh, uh, I, wonder, I wonder if they, ha I wonder if they, um, I wonder if they have uh, decorations for New Year's, icicles and, and light blue and stuff. And uh, Sure they do. But the spirit that works in them is that, oh, we don't, want, we don't want nobody to think we're Christians or nothing. Don't even have nothing red and green. That's ridiculous. If I want to paint my house red and green, I will. I don't, but if I wanted to, I would. Nothing wrong with it. It don't help you, it don't hurt you. It's, 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 people are ashamed. I heard about some guys going to preach on the street one day, and this guy, uh, uh, he put his Bible in a brown paper bag and walked across the flea market with it like this. Brown bag in his Bible. Because somebody might see him with a Bible. In front of people. That's a sad day, brother. That's a sad day when our forefathers bled and died that we could have this book. And people got their head cut off and everything so we could have this book. And we put it in a brown paper bag, prayed somebody might see. Take that thing with you. Take it in a restaurant. Does does anybody in here take their Bible in a restaurant besides me? I mean, I don't ask you to raise your hand, but and I mean I don't every time, but when I'm traveling and stuff, I stop at Taco Bell. I go in there and I took my Bible in there. I'll sit down and read it. And uh, I know you, you take that phone and you wouldn't die, you'd die before you go in there without that phone. Take your Bible once in a while. Not to show off, but to read it and not be ashamed of it. That's why we have bumper stickers on our car. Not just to witness, but to, to not be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ and what, he, what he'd done for us. I heard about this guy. He said, um, you've heard me tell that story before. And I, I think of it every time. I didn't think of it until just now, but... I started talking about being ashamed. This, this old man, old woman raised their kid all, all their life to try to do the best they could for them. They lived out on a farm uh, back 75 years ago, back in the old, out in the country, and they didn't have nothing hardly and worked their whole life to send their boy to college. And sure enough, they saved their whole life. He got out of high school, and they sent him to some big elite, fancy big college in a far, in a big city. And he went off state a few months, and they decided to go visit him. And they took, uh, they took an old beat-up car, best they had, and drove for two or three, two days, I think, to see that boy in college. They pulled up that big university, and they had never seen nothing like that in their life. No mama had on an old print, checkered dress down to here, old grandma, with her hair, like a mama with her hair back in a bun, and the old man had on his overalls, and they got out, and sure enough, right down the street there come that boy with some of his 
cool, hip, trendy friends, you know. He done got in there and made friends. All and they was walking down through there like that. And the mama came and said, son, hey, son, we come to see you. And that boy in front of his friend looked like he said, I don't know you. And went, come on, walking down through there laughing with his, with his friends. And I'm telling you what, somebody like that, need, they need the absolute rear end beat off of them. Amen? How could anybody do that? His family worked all his life, their life to send that little brat to college, and he was ashamed of his parents. You'd be surprised the kids are ashamed of their parents coming to their school. Mom, our car's not nice enough. Mom, this. Mom, that. We don't live in a nice enough house. Now, now listen, buddy. You Listen, Jesus Christ done more for you than your mama. You better not be ashamed of him where you work. You'd be proud to be a Christian. Amen? Don't be a smart aleck. Don't be a self-righteous. Take you some tracks off that, off that rack back there. And brother, you lay them things down. And, and if somebody gets offended, say, I'm sorry. Don't mean nothing by it. But I love Jesus. And I want to try to be a witness for him. If they don't want to hear me pray, they better not ask me. Because I'm going to. If we do it at... at at Thanksgiving, family gets together. Danny, Danny lead us in prayer. You got a great opportunity to stand up for the Lord at Christmas and Thanksgiving. Easiest time of the whole year to witness is Christmas. Easiest time, best, best time in the world to go street preaching is Christmas. People are just in that frame of mind. Very few people turn down a track. They want to hear about the manger and the Mary and Joseph and the virgin birth and all that kind of stuff. Listen. Paul said, I'm in and no, and nothing be ashamed. Nothing. He said, I'm not going to be ashamed. He said, the Lord done too much for me. And he said, I will not in nothing. I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Now, we hit now one of the greatest verses in the whole New Testament. It's one of the most famous, well-known, most quoted verses in the entire New Testament. And it's verse 21. You need to learn this one. Remember it. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I choose shall choose, I want not. Now look at what he said. Verse 21. Everybody needs to learn that verse. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. My goodness, that's, that's so lofty, that's so great, that's so poetic, that's so inspired, that's so, man, that's that come from God, brother. Paul said, look, he said, for me to live is Christ, and if, if I live, Jesus Christ is going to be manifest in my body, and if I die, that's even better. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? What are you going to do with somebody like that? Look at verse number 23. For I'm in a strait betwixt two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Lordy mercy. Like that French Huguenot I told you about. Uh, they said, we'll, we'll come and get you and put you in exile. He said, that's all right. My home is in glory. Uh, you can do whatever you want to. That ain't you. He said, uh, you'll, well, you'll lose loss of goods. He said, that's all right. My treasure is laid up in heaven. They said, we'll put you in prison. He said, I'll be freer in chains uh, than you'll be out of them. That's what he told his accusers. And they said, we'll cut your head off. He said, my soul will be in heaven quicker than his majesty's horses will be back to the palace. You, what are you going to do with somebody like that? If you, if you put him in jail, he writes letters and people get saved everywhere. If you kill him, he's a whole lot better off. He's wanting that. And if you let him live, he's going to win. What can you, the world can't do nothing with him. The world cannot do anything with a Christian that's sold out for God. We, we can't. Hey, Paul said, look, you don't kill me, kill me. I, I, I got a desire. He's a little suicidal there, you know. He really was. He had got a glimpse of it a few ch chapters earlier there in 1 Corinthians where he said he got a man known in Christ caught up. And I seen, and he had been living dangerous ever since. You know what I mean? He said, if you go in there, Paul, you're liable to get killed. Ah, all right, if I do, it's better. Better. He said, now, it's better better for you that I stay here. We'll get to that verse in a minute. You're better off. Uh, a lot of times when preachers say, well, I'm just, I just having such a hard time. I wish the Lord just take me on. And we all get like that once in a while. But to stay here is more needful for our kids, for, for our family, 
uh, for our, our, our churches. As long as the Lord will let us stay here, we can benefit people. And that's, that's basically what he's saying. Now look, he said to live is Christ, to die is gain. So in other words, he said, when I'm, when I'm here, Jesus is in heaven, and my hands are his hands on earth. I, was, I was, he read about uh, Franklin Graham, and I don't, I don't know what you think about Franklin Graham personally. I don't really even know. I know who he is. Uh, but I know that Samaritan Purse does put out a lot of food and help, stuff like that, so that's good. I, I don't know. He's probably not much on doctrine or the Bible or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not singing his praises. But anybody who tries to help people, feed people, stop more, you know, stuff like that, I'm, I'm all for that. And what they're saying is, we're his hands. The head's in heaven. The body of Christ is on this earth. We're his feet. Jesus don't go knock on doors. We do. We do it in his stead. That's Christ in me. That's Christ in me. Jesus don't put money in the offering plate. We do. With these hands. I, the only hands he has on this earth is mine and yours. The only feet he has on this earth is mine and yours. The only voice he has on this earth is mine and yours. The church. And that's what he's saying. He said, for me to live, it's Christ. He said, look, I died a long time ago. I'm a dead man walking. Jesus Christ is manifesting his life in me. So if, if you kill me, I'll go be with him. If you don't, I'll represent him here on earth. Take your pick. Do whatever you want to. You can, what are you going to do with somebody like that? That's victory, brother. That's victory. Too many Christians are running around scared to death trying to make their self comfortable. And that's about all we do. About everything most people do is to make this flesh comfortable. You know why we have heaters? Heaters to make the flesh comfortable. You know how we have food in the refrigerator? To make this flesh comfortable. You know I have a bed to sleep in instead of a hard floor? Make the flesh comfortable. Nothing wrong with that. But, but that's not what we're supposed to live for. We're supposed to say, whether in, in the body, out of the body, to depart from Christ is far better. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's true. That's another doctrine y'all need to learn. And I, I'm, I'm assuming most of you already know that. There's no such thing in the Bible as soul sleep. Uh, your soul don't sleep. Your soul stayed awake all night while you're in bed. Just your body sleeps. Your soul is conscious. So when you die, if I fell over dead right here tonight, my soul would leave my body and go to be with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord immediately. You don't wait till judgment day. People say, well, you're, you're going to wait till judgment day. No, you're not. Your body is. Your body is. you got to understand the difference between body and, and soul and spirit. And if you, if you died tonight, we put your body in the grave, your soul would go to heaven or hell, depending on whether you're saved or not, and your spirit would go to God that gave it. And you, you, when, you, when you die, you're absent from the body and present with the Lord, just like that, immediately. Isn't that something? He said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. Listen, y'all. Do you really believe? I'm sure most of you do. You're here at church on Wednesday night. Do you really believe, right, if you got killed on your way home, that immediately you're in the presence of the Lord? Have you thought about that lately? Woo! Buddy, that's, that's shouting ground, y'all. Now, I don't want to get mangled. Getting killed ain't too bad, but getting mangled is what I don't want. You know, I don't wheelchair 40 years or 30 years, or ever, the rest of your life, or whatever. That'd be rough. But, uh, but uh, getting killed, I mean, uh, really, honestly, how many times have you been to a funeral, and you look at somebody and say, well, they're better off. That's true. That's what he said. To die is gain. To die is gain. Ain't no other religion can offer that. They, the politics, politics don't offer that. They say, well, sit up here in Washington, D.C., and we're going to make decisions that affect the world. What could we do any greater? Well, I'll tell you what you can do greater than that. Give somebody hope after they're dead. That's better than making policies. Man. That's better than enforcing laws. That's sure. uh, okay. But brother, you're going, you ain't going to do nothing better for somebody than to helping them go to heaven when they leave this world. What? Name it. Somebody tell me. Am, am I missing something? I don't think so. I've thought this thing through. You know, I told you I used to 
I used to play music when I first got saved. And we had a little group. And we were around churches singing all over, all over Marion, all over Nebo. And we'd sing. They'd have them Saturday night singing and everything. And, and then I felt like the Lord's called me to preach. And I thought, man, if I scream and holler, you're going to ruin the singing voice and all that. But I thought, you know what? Anybody can get up and sing a song. I want to do something that will get the most people in heaven that I can possibly do. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing right now. What can you do to get the most people to heaven? You say, well, Brother Danny, I'm not a preacher. I understand that. Everybody's not a preacher. But I tell you what you can do. You can witness to a signpost, brother. Witness to everybody coming and going. Um, that preacher, old Larry Brown, was listening to on the way down here. He was telling a story about that boy, and he was, he was um, handicapped. He, he was a little slow. And I forgot his name, uh, Willie. He said his name was Willie. And he went and visited Willie, and no, the other churches wouldn't have him because he said he's... He, he, he was a little bit big and his feet was sort of sideways and he walked funny and he sort of talked like this, like that. And he said, Willie, I'll come get you if you come to church, Sonny. And uh, he, Willie got on the bus and Willie got saved, you know, and, and, and everything. And, and uh, he said, <laughs> he said, he took him to church that first Sunday and he said, uh, uh, he got to looking for him and couldn't find him, looking for him, and couldn't find him. And he said, he saw him coming up the sidewalk toward the bus. And he said, Willie's face was right between two of the most well-to-do, richest ladies that go to our church. I mean, fur coats, diamond rings, everything. He said, Willie's face. I said, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. And he said, Willie, come running around there uh, to tell his bus captain that he got saved. He said, he run right between them two women, knocked one of them over in the parking lot and knocked another up against the car. And he said, Willie, what would you do that for? He said, I got saved. I got saved. You know, he said the, the morning he come and get him to church, he said he uh, went visiting that day, and he said, if, you, if I come get you tomorrow, will you go to church, Willie? He said, yes, the, I sure will, my cap. And he said, I'll be here tomorrow morning, 8.30. Then I got, he said, I pulled a bus up there. Blow the horn, ding. He didn't come out. He said, blow the horn in, ding. Didn't come out. And me and Frankie, Frankie was just like his. That guy had his attention much. I got a lot of respect for a preacher that can get a five-year-old's attention. A lot of respect. And uh, hell, Frankie was glued to that thing. I said, you like that preacher? He said, yeah, yeah. And I, I said, uh, will he come out? He finally, he said, I was getting ready to leave. I said, don't go. Not. He told me he'd come this morning. He didn't come. He said, about that time, will he come running around the side of the house? Said, wait, wait, wait. And, and he jumped on the bus. And he said, I didn't think you was coming, Willie. And he said, he sat down and he said, can I tell you something? Claude, I believe we got Buster, Buster driver's name, Claude. He said, can I tell you something? He said, you sure can. What's wrong? And he said, I got up this morning and he said, the devil come in my room. And he sat on the edge of my bed and said, you ain't going to church, Willie. And he's, and Frankie's eyes got about that big around. He said, the devil's sitting on the end of the bed. He said, you're not going to church. Well, long story short, he said, I won't let you out of here. And it, Willie said, I jumped up and run out the window. Jumped out the window. I come running around the house. And, uh, he, and the story went that he did come and he did get saved. And there was another one on there. That I don't know if I can tell you that one or not. It was where he made fun of this woman at McDonald's. He said, he said, we went to, uh, he went, went to that fancy, he said, we went to that fancy, uh, how'd he say that? Uh, Golden Arch Country Club restaurant, McDonald's. And um, he, he, give a woman a tracker, and I ain't gonna tell you that story, you'll have to listen to the sermon. Uh, but anyway, good night, it was good. It was good. And you know what? That's what Paul was saying. He said, look, if I live, Jesus gets glory. If I die, Jesus gets the glory. If I live or if I die, he gets the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't lose. Uh, I'll, I'll get that here in a minute. And if I can get my, I don't usually bring my phone in here. Uh, but I'll, I'll get to that sermon if y'all want to listen to it. I, I'd recommend it. It's very, very, very good. So look at verse number uh, uh, 22. And he said, if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. What I shall choose, I what not. I like that Old Testament English. And uh, he said this. He said, all right, there it is. Brother Larry Brown, 
preaching, it's time to go back and get the something or another. Time to go back and get that, Larry Brown. Time to go back and get the something. He said, "Go back and get this, and go back and get that." Forgot what he what he called what he called. Get the golden shields. Time to go back and get the golden shields. And look at verse number. I know there'll be people online want to listen to that. Verse twenty three. For I'm in a strait betwixt two. He said, "I'm I'm sort of caught in the middle. I want to go be with Jesus, but I want to stay here and help y'all and preach to you." And he said. It's far better to go with Christ. Nevertheless, it's better for y'all that I stay here and minister to you. So far better. Not just a little bit better. Far better. Heaven is far better than anything we can imagine down here. Once in a while, you, I meet people and they'll say, but Danny, I don't want to mean this disrespectful or nothing, but please don't think bad of me. I say, okay, oh, you ain't going to tell me nothing I ain't heard before. And they say, you promise you won't think about me? And I said, no, go ahead. And they say, what are we going to do in heaven forever? <laughs> I said, I don't mean that bad, but I mean, you know, forever. Don't want we get... And I said, no, no, no. You'll never be bored. There'll be no such thing as being disappointed or bored or dull. It'll be like being plugged into 220 forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, brother. Never a sad, dull moment Never, ever, ever anything bad. No sorrow, no sickness, no, no pain. Not only that, no beer. Just that's a smell of somebody walking down the street. No wine, no rock music, no rap music. Amen. No dirty country music, no sin, no devil, no lying, no stealing. I mean, brother, what are you talking about? Uh, the battle will be over. We'll be in the presence of Jesus, have a brand new body, totally satisfied forever and ever and ever. That's far better. That's far better. Having a desire. If you live here long enough, you'll, you'll say, yeah, it's far better. This old body starts breaking down. It starts hurting. You got a lot of pain. And so it's far better. Remember, I, remember that little part there in verse 23. And underline that, and that in your Bible. Far better. That'd be a good sermon, man. I'll preach on that sometime. Far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Quickly, uh, verse 25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for your furtherance and joy of faith. He said, God ain't done with me yet. I'm going to stay here a little while longer and preach to you. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now remember, remember this. That word conversation in your New Testament almost always, if not always, don't just mean your talk. When we say I had a conversation with someone, that means we just spoke words back and forth. Conversation in the real biblical sense means your lifestyle. You're the style, the kind of life you're living. And that's the right definition of that conversation. Conversing back and forth. Conversation would mean you're like, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Not a bunch of arguing and fussing and, de and, ar and I mean, and, and there's a time when we have to stand up for what's right and and take a stand and all that. But he, he said not a bunch of division. And a bunch of striving. A bunch of striving together. You know. Um, I have people sometimes. They'll they'll write me texts. Or they'll send them down. And people say. Why don't you answer that brother Danny. And the reason I don't. Because I know they're just trying to pick a fight. They're not really wanting the truth. And sometimes I'll just give them the truth. And if they come back at me. Blah, 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 I'll just let it go. I'm not going to strive. Get into a bunch of strife with that. Uh, ain't got time for it. You ain't, you know, they are just, they don't want, they don't want to, they don't want to learn. They want to prove you wrong and, and nothing being terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation. That verse right there always bothered me. And if you'll look in commentaries, there's not hardly any Bible preacher that can give you a sane definition of that verse. Let's look at it. Verse 28. You won't hardly find nobody can make heads or tails out of this verse of Scripture. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. 
which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of and that of God. Now, I'll tell you why I've always looked at that verse. Always have. I never did feel completely like I had it figured out, but I've always looked at that verse like, and nothing terrified by the adversaries. So, like I was talking about a minute ago, about not being ashamed. If I went to the ball game and they said, lead us in prayer, and I said, no, nah, well, ain't you a preacher? Well, yeah, and you know all that. Uh, I'm being terrified of my adversaries, and to them, that's an evident token of perdition. They're just going to think I'm a hypocrite. They're just going to think, boy, you ain't got much, have you? That's the way I've always looked at that verse. If somebody's got it better than that, I'm all ears. But I've read, I've, you wouldn't believe what the commentators and the Bible expositors do to that verse. They tear it all to pieces. Amen. And that's the way he words it right there in verse 28. And in nothing terrible. I think that's what he's what he's meaning. I'm not going to be terrified by my head. That's right. That's right. Which is to them yeah. an evident token of perdition. I mean, that's the way I read. Now I read other ones that, that, that says it means um uh, it'd be like it'd be like David. When David sinned, the Bible said he gave the enemies of the Lord a great occasion to blaspheme, and they had a good reason to make fun of the things of God because ha ha ha, he's supposed to be the king, he's supposed to be a, a man of God, and look what he done, and they blasphemed because of that. And and if we're doing right, we should never be afraid of anything they say, anything they do. Don't be terrified by it. Don't. If they, if they come out with something next week and they say, we have discovered, like, like this stuff they say about the world being four and a half billion years old. And you know what? They laugh at us if we don't believe that. We laugh right back at them. They don't a bit more know that than that microphone speak Greek. They don't know the world's four and a half billion years old. You say, no, scientists have done... I don't know who you... Them scientists, they don't know that. They don't know that. One reason, because it ain't. And another reason, if it was, they still couldn't know it. You can't know back four billion years ago, people. Nobody can. You say, well, they've studied this and they studied that. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I... I believe in science as long as it's not against the Bible. I have a hard time believing all this stuff they tell us about the universe. Right now, right now, we're doing a thousand miles an hour going around and around and around and around. Right now. We're also, we're going a thousand miles an hour like that. And they're going 66,000 miles an hour this way. Well, you, you, you'd be, you're in a pinball machine. But, they say, but they say, well, the reason that is because everything's spinning with it. When you see them same stars, I wonder why you see the same side of the moon all the time. You always see the same side of the moon all the time. And it's spinning and we're spinning. It's spinning and we're spinning. And yet you see the same man, the moon, all that same. I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist, but like me who think, don't, don't just... Don't just be a man. Well, that's what they said in school. You know what else they said in school? You come from a monkey. And that's a lie from hell. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not a genius, y'all. But I wasn't, I wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> or the, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. <laughs> like I said, I don't know if I was or not. But uh, uh, don't, we, don't, we don't have to be scared. If they come out and say we found the bones of Jesus, life at them. They didn't find the bones of Jesus. They proved it. Life. If they proved the Bible ain't true, we'd laugh our heads off. Because they really ain't proven it. It's a, it's a seduction. It's a, it's a delusion. You say, well, they, you done got your mind made up. The Bible's true no matter what. The, yep, that's right. Sure do. Our mind made up, brother. I made that decision a long time ago. We're going to this thing all the way through to the end, right, people? We're going to push this thing all the way through. Are you with me? There ain't no turning back. No turning back. That's not just a little kid song. It's our life. We don't turn back. You say, well, if you go down, we'll be, it'd be far better. We'll be with Christ. Make up your mind. Don't be a little, little Christian that's 
every time somebody oh my goodness, they said at work that Genesis wasn't really true and that Adam and Eve wasn't real people. And I just wonder, I, you know, life at them. Life. Don't be terrified of anything they say, brother. Them people don't know what they're talking about. This old book right here, brother. I'm going to show you some stuff Sunday night. This coming Sunday night, I'm going to show you some stuff. This old book been here, brother, uh, before the, all the other books in the world. It'll be here when the rest of them's gone. Heaven and earth will pass away. That book right there ain't going nowhere. You got an old copy of that old King James Bible, brother. You hang on to that thing. Believe it with all your heart. It'll do when I'm dying. It'll do when I'm dying. They ain't got nothing no better. Darwin ain't going to help you when you're dying. Look here what it said there. Verse number 29. I'm through. And for unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his name's sake. Huh? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the difference would be, really. I don't, I don't know. In the behalf of Christ, I'm giving you this in, in Christ's behalf. Not just believe on Him. Oh boy, I got saved. Woo! I believed on Jesus. Oh yeah, something else goes with that. Suffering. Suffering. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as a Christian that's really living right, that's going to get through this life without some kind of suffering. Some kind of terrible thing's going to happen. I know that's doom and gloom. People don't, why so negative, negative, negative? Uh, why are you so in denial, brother? He said, it's given to you to suffer. Now, thank God, if he's give you good health, and you've got a nice car and a job, and your family's together, and your marriage is good, you ought to shout and praise God. Amen. But somewhere down the road, Mark it down. Man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. Just as sure as sparks fly up in a fire, that's how sure man's going to have trouble. You will not get out through this world without having some kind of trouble. If it ain't marriage trouble, it's financial trouble. If it ain't financial trouble, it's physical trouble. If it ain't physical trouble, it's other uh, spiritual trouble. You're not going to get through unless you just backslide and give in and do what the devil wants you to. You might slide through for a while. But then you're going to get it either way. You're going to get it either way. You might as well get it for God. And get a reward for it. So you're, if you're living right. You're not going to escape suffering. Eventually it's coming. Eventually it's coming. The greatest thing. I, 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 when I see all these young guys. Out preaching healing. Healing. You're never supposed to get sick. Be healed. Be healed. Be healing. You just claim the victory over that. You just claim the victory over that. You just, you watch them. Eventually, they wind up in the hospital. All of them do. Uh, Catherine Kuhlman, the great healer, remember her, and all, Oral Roberts, they all wound up in hospital and graves. Man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. A.A. A. Allen, all the great, wonderful, old daddy, and all, <laughs> all them people, oh, great healers of days gone by, they're all gone. They're all gone, the rest of them going too. Movie stars that live in private. Well, I've, I've seen where movie stars live. They took me to, when I went to Hollywood, they, they, took, they said, Danny, I want to take you to Beverly Hills. I said, let's go. Let's see it. So we drove up in Beverly Hills, and it's it's hills. It really is. It's like going up through there. You know, there's hills. And they got big old bushes, like hedges, high as this ceiling around their house so you can't see them. They said, well, that's where Bob Hope's family lives, and there's where so-and-so lives. I said, well, I can't see nothing. And And they have... Big old iron gates. You know, they don't believe in having walls at the border, but they got one around their house. Bunch of hypocrites. Uh, uh, you know, Gavin and Nancy Pelosi and all of them. I guarantee you they got bodyguards and gates. They don't want us to have a gun, but they want their bodyguards to have one. But anyway, uh, you can't, you can't, and you know what? Them people was in there. They said, oh, Howard Hughes. Was it Howard Hughes used to be the richest man in the world, whatever. He, he had, he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even come out of his room because he's afraid he'd get a germ. He was a germaphobe. And he said, I'm going to get a germ. I'm going to get a germ. Guess what? He got one and died. Uh, they said, them, some guy like that, they have three or four bedrooms like Hitler did. And he's sleeping one one night and one night. He didn't know what bedroom he'd be in in case somebody come kill him. He finally died. Killed himself, didn't he? Said he did. Somebody said he's still alive. Uh, him and Elvis up there partying last night. But... Uh, uh, listen, you know what? It's going to get you. You ain't going to get through. 
You're not going to get through without getting sick, and you're not going to get through without dying unless the rapture comes. That's right. Hospital bed and graveyard is the future for everybody in here if Jesus don't come. And so he said, it's given to you. Accept it. Accept it. Take it. And that way when it comes, you won't lose your faith and go crazy and think God done you wrong. You'll say, well, it's my turn. My turn. I'll take it and go on through. All right. I, I talked longer than I wanted to, but I want to finish that chapter tonight. Did I read that last verse? I don't think I did, did I? What does it say, Brother Mike? Uh, that last verse, 30, 30, or 30. Who's got it? There you go. He said, that same conflict that you saw in me and, and see it in me now. So he set himself up as an example so we could look to him. I'm glad them apostles, I mean, I hate it for them, but I'm glad they got locked up and beaten and everything because that makes me feel better when I go through something like they did it, so I can too. All right, let's stand. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this little study uh, tonight. I thank you for our church. Thank you, Lord, for Shining Light Baptist Church and what it stands for. Thank you the doors are still open. Thank you we still got a book that we can trust in and believe. Thank you, Lord, that we got people that love you and love your work and love your will and your ways. And God, I pray that you bless everybody here tonight. Whatever battle they may be fighting, I pray you bless them. Have your way in our hearts this evening. God, do what ought to be done. Lord, I pray that you'd get us ready for Sunday. Help us to get that roof fixed on, the, on this building uh, Saturday and the visiting done and, and all the other stuff we've got to do Saturday. Lord, I pray that you'd help us get that done. Lord, help the men uh, have, a, have a burden to help us. And Lord, I pray, God, that you're, you're getting honor to yourself now. God, will <laughs> thank you and praise you for what you do. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless y'all. Have a good one. And we'll see you in a day or two, Lord willing. Mm-hmm.